industry has consistently increased in the past nine years, and the internet may have played a huge role for the spike. The Commission on Population and Development says pregnancies among girls aged 15 and below had increased by 7%, from 2,250 cases in 2018 to 2,411 in 2019. This is equivalent to almost seven minors giving birth every day. The uh, immediate effect of pagbubuntis uh, sa kabataan ay nagda-drop out sila no? uh, sa kanilang uh, pag-aaral and the question in some regions na the earlier you go into the internet, the earlier you engage in pre-marital sex. The youngest Filipina to get pregnant in this country is 10 years old. The Commission on Population and Development sounded the alarm over the increasing trend of girls giving birth in the last 11 years, when one out of 10 pregnancies have been consistently among girls 15 years old and below. How will government address this social emergency and how will the girls continue to live under these conditions? Meanwhile, the latest price freeze on meat that worsened food inflation also aggravated the burden of farmers and the livestock industry. Congress has proposed Bayanihan 3 to help businesses and industries and poor Filipinos to survive the pandemic. But what are the better policies to address inflation and poverty? We discuss in this episode of The Chiefs. And welcome to this uh, midweek edition of The Chiefs. With us, of course, in the studio is Robbie Lampay of Juan News. Hi, Robbie. Mm -hmm. And online, we have Anna Marie Pamento, one of the Philippine star, and Luchi Cruz Valdez, the head of News 5. Ladies and Robbie, uh, happy midweek. Mm -hmm. Happy Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, happy Wednesday. So what's the big story today or tonight? Well, first, a uh, qualified uh, Ooh, announcement. Na. Yung February 15 na pagdating ng mga bakuna. <laughs> ano <pala>? <laughs> Tentative po. <laughs> Happy Valentine's. Indicative. Indicative, indicative, indicative date. Yeah, indicative, indicative date. date. Oh. Uh, but, uh, like many Valentine's dates, uh, it's an indicative date only. But in the meantime, tuloy lang yung preparations for the vaccines. Uh, they're still saying mukhang mapapaganda pa. Dry run, as you know, yesterday. Yes, yes. And then uh, mukhang, mukhang kaya naman. The actual dry run from the airport to, uh, to RITM, RITM in Alabang. Mm -hmm. Which is not really that far, uh, they're not really that far apart. Oh. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ami? Philippine Star, what do you have? Champ, hey, yung donation down ng China na 500,000 vaccines, nadating din at ang mauuna priority according to Senator Bongo, eh, mga soldiers and policemen. Mm. So, so, hindi naman siguro masasayang yon yung mga natatakot dun sa vaccine. Makikita natin kung anong epekto. Uh, Akala ko ba si Presidente mauna? Kaya lang, yung dahil mga, wala pa nga yung, ano, yung EUA ng Chinese. Eh, wala pa nga. Eh. Baka Astra daw or Pfizer, di ba? Oh, Pfizer. Di, ngayon, kung may darating, dapat eh, pwede siya yung Chinese para... Para, uh -huh. hindi, para nga mapawit uh -huh. ang takot ng mga tao. Oh, but I don't think that's a coincidence. Remember yung dilemma natin when it comes to the Chinese vaccines na napakababa ng confidence level and government keeps reminding, wala namang sapilitan dito, it, can be, it will be vulgar. But talk about police and military, iba ibang usapan. Walang, walang choice sila. Hindi ko alam kung if they will have a choice. No, I mean, yeah, that's an order. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But yeah. but I mean, oh. just to be clear about this, so so yung uh, for AFP and PNP, for uniform services uh, specifically, sila uunain for the Sinovac. Chinese vaccines. Sinovac so, will pag, be priority. Prioritize na. Pag uh, pag may ibang mauna, like whether it's Pfizer or Moderna, hindi mapupunta yan sa soldiers. Is that what you're saying? Kasi, ah, hindi kasi, malinaw yun, ah. Kasi may, hindi, ano, hindi we, malinaw. we have a list of priorities already. First of all, the 1.7 million yeah, uh, health workers and the SWD frontline personnel. And then the senior citizens who are in the Kaya tatanggapin ba ng healthcare citizens. worker yung Sinovac? Yan ang problema nga, di ba? Yeah. Mm. Pero yung kasi, it might turn everything topsy-turvy if, if uh, that's going Pag to be the interpretation. Pag hindi sinunod yung priorities, mm. yes. Mm. Yeah. Ah, okay. So and of course may nagprotesta lang naman yan siguro. Yeah. And I, I suppose that also depends on sino maunang dumating. Hmm. Uh, will it be Pfizer nga and Moderna wala or will it be Sinovac? Wala pa yung Sinovac. Eh? So ah, hindi wala go. pa. Eh, wala pa yung EUA yung mga iba. Hmm. Baka mauna pa yung gamalay yung Sputnik 5. Baka mauni pa dito. 
Uh, in the meantime, uh, public service announcement, kumakalat na yung mga Bakuna. fake vaccines, yung mga counterfeit vaccines, the WHO sounding the alarm, China itself is sounding the alarm na may mga, baka may mga kumakalat dyan. Very basic rule of thumb, if somebody is offering you something, most likely po counterfeit yan. Mm -hmm. Counterfeit or smuggled, right? or smuggled, or, or no. smuggled uh, in which case it is counterfeit by definition. Yes, and it might be real, but you can't get certified anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Ano raw yan eh, placebo daw yung mga yan, ginamit mm, sa trial, kaya, ano, tapos ni-recycle. Or saline solution, oo. Uh -huh. Okay, uh -oh. well, uh, baka ma malayo yung usapan natin ha. <laughs> Our guest is already here, smiling at us. <laughs> Nakikinig sa pinag-usapan natin. Our first guest for tonight, of course, is from the Commission on Population and Development. Ang kanyang director, o executive director, si Undersecretary Juan Antonio G.P. Perez III. Doc G.P., uh, well, thank you for joining us and welcome back to the Chiefs. Thank you for having me again. Mm. Yeah. Happy to be back. Always a pleasure to have <laughs> you on board, uh, Doc GP. Yes. Uh, Doc, uh, well, um, uh, you can say previously, I, I, I suppose we all thought that yung, yung most problematic na areas pagdating sa population management would be yung mga areas na off the beaten track. Yung uh, konti, konti lamang ang uh, education ng mga tao, yung wala silang access to reproductive health services, barangay health centers, and government services. But uh, from, from the stats of uh, Popcom, it looks like one-third of uh, yung mga teenage pregnancies uh, came from, for example, Metro Manila, Calabarzon, and, and Region 3. Tapos yung dalawang 10 years old na batang nabuntis, Metro Manila and Calabarzon. What does that tell us about uh, that perception of ours from before? Yes, uh, actually yung data is coming from the 2019 release Opo. ng Philippine Statistics Authority. It takes quite a while bago ma-release yung data niyan. Eh. Uh, it's true the three regions have the uh, more than 20,000 of the 60,000 minors who gave birth. Uh, dahil nandito rin ang one-third ng population ng Pilipinas. Eh. So uh, it's really, in a way, linked to the number of people mm. um, in the area. Uh, outside of uh, Metro Manila, Calabarzon, and uh, Central Luzon, marami rin sa Cagayan de Oro, mm -hmm. Davao region, Cotabato region, and Cebu. I think those are the areas, uh, yung Cotabato, hindi masyadong populous yan, but uh, the health system there is not so strong, particularly in the areas around Barn. So that might be a factor also. Mm -hmm. uh, Doc, I, okay, I, I, just uh, a quick I, qualifier lang, sorry, Lucio, just a quick qualifier yeah. lang, just to frame uh, all our conversations, and I think it's important to emphasize, you're saying this is 2019 data. Uh, this is not, this, we're not talking about what this happened pre during covid Yes, not yet. Mm. Um, the, uh, it might take to the end of the year before we find out what the data for 2020 is. Mm. Uh, affected din yung civil registration kasi ng COVID. Mm. Nagsara yung mga opisina. So, nahuhuli yung data ngayon. So, this is the fastest that they can come up uh, the, the data um, so far. Mm. Okay, I, I was saying that... Uh, we understand the raging hormones for adolescents, say, age, let's just say, uh, 15 to 19, no? Especially mm -hmm. as they step out of high school and into college and uh, there's more freedom, let's just say. But the 10-year-olds and the 12-year-olds, I mean, you know, yung mga yun, hindi pa adolescent kung tutuusin. I mean, hindi pa sila technically. Paano nangyayari yun? How, how does that happen? Well, uh, it's a trend that we've been seeing rising since the turn of the century. No? Sabihin natin. 20 years ago, it was only about 700 who, who were giving birth na 10 to 14. No? They were already at the time, yung ganung age. But it's tripled over the last... Oh, yeah. uh, two decades, and particularly in the ni last nine years, no? Talagang every year nadadagdagan ng nadadagdagan. And um, I feel uh, the preventive measures are not in place, particularly yung comprehensive sexuality education. Sabi ng RH law, dapat from grade five uh, mag-start yan. Pero alam mo yung 10-year-old, that's four years, that's uh, grade four. Hmm. Exactly. So, so are they victims to... of 
are they victims of sexual molestation? Did an adult take advantage of them? Or how many of these are actually, you know, uh, is it sex between two adolescents or at least two teenagers? Mm -hmm. Ano ba yun? Paano ba yun? Well, actually, ang data ng PSA shows that... Uh, one only one in three of the partners of these adolescents are of the same age. Mm -hmm. Yung kaidad nila. Two out of three, uh, two, out, two, two out of three of the partners are older than them, 20 years and older. Oh, okay. So there's a degree of, uh, you know, may, may power play. Yes. And, that's, yes, and that's really, that's really officially legally rape already, di ba? Yes, yes. Mm. 10, 11, and 12. That's legal, uh, the statutory rate. Mm. And kung masunod yung bagong batas nila Senator Subiri and others, it will go up to uh, below 16 or, yeah, below 16 yung statutory yes. rate. Mm. So that will really mean that uh, if it were applied today uh, to the 2019 statistics, that's around uh, 10,000 siguro na statutory rates. If, well, so wow. it, it, it would be a deterrent, I believe, if the law comes into play. At least hmm. yung below 16 might be might have a level of protection uh, or deterrence. So, yes. so you say kung nangyari yan in 2019, siguro naman malinaw na medyo tataas yan in 2020 when everyone was under quarantine and the children were were closeted with abusive uh, adults. So, malapit yes, man sa right within the household or kapitbahay. So, are, yes, are I think abusive? more likely yan sa below 15. That's correct. Tama yan, Ami, because uh, they're together with their abuser every day, 24-7. So most likely, cases of abuse of this nature will go up panahon ng COVID. So we'll see, we might see it again go up in 2020. Yeah, but so as you're, you're, not, you're uh, also assuming that the abuser, or you're also assuming that the abuser is part the of the household. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most likely, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or neighbor, someone the person knows, uh, the child yeah. knows. Uh, the doc, in the meantime, uh, as as you as you emphasize, no, this is a trend that was starting uh, at the turn of the century. At talagang nakikita natin tumataas. What are the factors that are glaring? Uh, starting from the turn of the century that, that you think is, is easy to isolate as something that's, that's really aggravated this problem? Yeah, I think by the, second, the first decade, uh, after the 2011-2012, nakita ng UP Population Institute, more children uh, having access to the internet, having a smartphone. Mm. They did a survey in 2013, 85% my smartphone, yeah. uh, Children below 15 accessing the internet. No, so, uh, nandyan yung, uh, let's say, foundation mm. uh, that uh, social media laid. In a way, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a trap that happened because um, ang access ng, it's the social media that's giving these uh, young people uh, I see. everything they know about sexuality rather than parents or schools. Okay. So I, I, I see two different thing, two things there. Uh, one is obviously access to porn. Uh, that, that, that's something, and, and if you get your education that way, I mean, certainly that's, that's going to be a problem. But the other one, uh, going to, to access to social media and just being left on your own in social media brings up mm -hmm. issues like grooming, uh, brings up issues like yes. uh, strangers uh, uh, connecting with you and you not necessarily know who you're connecting with. That hap yes, I believe that's also happening. Yung mga, yung having 500 friends, no, uh, when you are uh, maybe an adolescent, uh, that's a new phenomenon. No, when when, we, when I was an adolescent, all my friends were my classmates, no, yeah. mga 50 lang kami. But uh, young people now, you have 500, a thousand friends. Anyone, any one of them could be a. Uh, an abuser, you, know, you you don't know. Hmm. But you know, I, it just it just makes me wonder, no? Because uh, these are kids, 
uh, wala namang kakayahan yan na magmotel halimbawa I, I, I just wonder where do they do it I mean uh, that's, uh, that's correct Luchi they actually yeah. do it at home at home most, most of more of the time most of the time it happens at home yung mga uh -huh. nagmomotel uh, probably yun yung mga may kaya uh -huh. but uh, based on UP PI survey it, it most uh, it most often happens at home walang plano yung lalaki yung nangunguna it's the, the boy who uh -huh. parts it up and uh, yun yung mga kaedad magkakaedad Okay. And, and you're also so, implying na ano ano, you're implying na meron ding element of uh, consensual ano, participation. Hindi siya lahat mm -hmm. abusive. And uh, you were mentioning uh, interventions that are possible. Kasi, kasi this week merong istorya na pinatawag yung mga internet providers because of the increase in OSEC, yung online sexual explo exploitation of children. Ano yung mga naiisip niyong possible interventions to discourage this kind of behavior na medyo mahirap yatang makontrol kasi mga teenager yan eh. Yeah, yung problema sa online sex or cyber sex is hindi mo alam kung sino yung ipoprosecute because the ones the predators are outside of the country eh. And then uh, yung it might be yung mga magulang complicit so it's very difficult uh, on that uh, area. Um, that's why I believe uh, the intervention is really going to happen at community level. Mm. It might be that merong mga, we have to look at the data. There might be areas in the country where, where uh, this kind of abuse is more prevalent. No? For example, there were reports before, yung isang town sa Laguna where a lot of cyber sex or exploitation of minors was happening, Cebu, may mga ganun din. If we can, uh, we can, we might be able to identify these pockets of uh, uh, higher cases of abuse. So, you said yung, yung tinatanong ko yung intervention for pregnancies, teenage pregnancies. Oh, yes. Kaya sabi nyo, meron kayong mga suggestion. Yes, actually, um, we were surprised at the start of the year Nagsingit yung uh, Congress ng provision as they asked Popcom and uh, DSWD to come up with ideas and develop a program to protect teenage mothers and their children. That means uh, Congress now wants to consider hindi lang yung four piece, hindi lang yung older persons and disabled yung ikaapat na sector of the population needing social protection, we will now include teenage mothers who are minors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, kami ng DSWD, we're now working together to develop this program. And it will be, hindi katulad nung sa older persons, for example, na medyo, it's just one-sided, no? ayuda lang. But for younger persons, uh, teenage mothers, may education component, may health component, may developmental family, developmental perspective, and uh, maybe at, towards the end, we'll be able to develop a social amelioration package for them until they're more independent. So uh, it's going to be more, sabi na natin, more complex, maraming interventions, but we hope to have something in place before the end of the year. Mm. No? And uh, kami ng DSWD will just take the lead. There are other agencies that will bring on. But the look, that's for repeat pregnancies. Eh? What, what about uh, forestalling uh, first-time pregnancies of, uh, of uh, teenagers and, uh, and minors? Yeah, that's important uh, on the education side. No? Yes. Uh, yung, uh, we hope that uh, yung intervention sa education is not only school-based. Kasi sa ngayon, under the RH law, yung eskwelahan lang yan. But I believe for the 10 to 14, uh, kailangan community-based. You have to involve parents. You have to involve community leaders. Hmm. And we'll start with where it's happening. So we have to come up with a good database. Saan nangyayari ito? Hmm. So... Uh, then we'll uh, be more, sabihin na namin, more focused yeah. on these uh, cases uh, as they happen. 
Yeah, but 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 doc, uh, that's that point is really well taken. But in the meantime, that said, what does this say about the school-based sex education? Where are we now when it comes to school-based sex education? Unfortunately, we're barely starting. But uh, the modules have been developed, uh, the materials are there, pero sa tatlong region lang muna ginagawa ng DepEd. Eh. Oh, wow. So it needs to be ramped up. So maybe with this uh, mandate from Congress, uh, we can find the funds for DepEd to really uh, do it all over the country and maybe focus on those regions uh, where uh, the higher numbers are happening. The big numbers are happening. Doc, check new modules, but isn't this also isn't this also a reflection of uh, let's just say deteriorating values, no? Because uh, when we talk about you know teenage pregnancies, we usually tend to think about sex education. Uh a name values education, you know, for kids to know that. Uh, sex is something sacred and sex is something that really should be done only by uh, consenting adults within, in fact, the, you know, the, uh, the bounds of marriage. No? And, and, and simple purity, I guess, and you know, stuff like this. I mean, what has happened to that? Nobody seems to be drilling down on what kind of values we are teaching kids now. Well, actually, values are very much part of the K-12 curriculum. And they inject itong comprehensive sexuality education into those areas. But, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, we started with what we call pop population development education, the schools. And it was a soft kind of uh, education on sexuality, emphasizing on population. Kasi yun yung push noon eh to uh, control fertility rather than to look at rights, at sexuality, and other things. So that evolved yan into what we are seeing now, into comprehensive sexuality education. Pero sinasama ng DepEd yung values doon. So uh, um, I think what DepEd will do is uh, integrate nila in all the subjects, whatever the subject is. There will be an area for uh, sexuality education that's appropriate sa edad ng bata. So, um, it will be there. But, unfortunately, um, piecemeal pa muna. Mm. Uh, ang, uh, in, in the meantime, Doc, we keep saying this was pre-COVID, but we can't help but think about COVID. As you said, we're just barely starting. It's just in three areas in particular. Ngayon that we're online, in online, ano, even DepEd had to had to whittle down the curriculum um, for our for yeah. our uh, for our elementary and high school students. Was sex education one of the things that, uh, that was taken out of the curriculum over the past uh, over the past year? Well, um, since it's only being introduced, it's only been introduced since October. I doubt kung not quite siya no manakat. But it's very early days din kasi for comprehensive sexuality education. So uh, it may not be uh, in all the regions right now and even in the regions where they are, medyo beginning pa lang. Um, so I think uh, we may need to do more at the local government level to get local governments, barangays more involved. Uh, to target communities where this is happening more often than not. So it might have to be that kind of approach, Mona. Um, both uh, a mix of prevention and cure, no? Uh, kasi kung saan nangyayari, doon ka magbibigay ng tulong, pero alam mo rin, where it's happening, kailangan din ng prevention doon. So uh -huh. we might have to go with a mix of both approaches. Uh, in the early days. Doc, we, we don't just stand the need for, for community action dun sa problema ito. Pero like you said nga kanina, a, 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 a big chunk of, uh, of teenagers getting pregnant uh, is, is uh, caused by people who are within the same household. So, so how can we work around that? Uh, especially with, with quarantines and all that. Uh, sabi niya nga ninyo kanina, baka yeah. tumaas pa yung numbers ngayon eh, because of COVID-19. Uh, yeah, how how do we resolve that issue? Yeah, for the younger age group, yung 10 to 14, it's more likely uh, an issue of abuse. That's more difficult to deal with, no? 
walang mga institutions that we know of uh, that could deal with that. So, so ang approach namin is uh, to prevent particularly repeat pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Kung nangyari na sa iyo yun, uh, part of the effort is for you not to repeat the, the mistake. No? And so we'll focus Nawala. Nag-freeze yata si Doc okay. GP. Uh, because yes, sir. Because evidence is there. Pagka umulit ka, you're mired in poverty na. You say as part of prevention, you've been pushing for the expansion of RH access to younger girls. Kamusta yes. na po yun? There's been a lot of resistance from some sectors. Ano? What's the progress on that initiative? Well, uh, uh, If I recall, na medyo na-stall yung initiative sa Senate when Senator Soto came up with some objections. I think he was questioning uh, why the, the private schools were not as involved. And uh, the, eh, medyo tinigil ni Senator Risa Ontiveros yung plenary discussion. So, but we hope and we're trying to encourage uh, the Senate to go back Uh, and uh, discuss it again. Doon sa House, palipat-lipat ng committee, they don't know where to put the bill kung sa Youth uh, uh, Development Committee or sa Health or sa Population. So palipat-lipat pa ng committee. We hope the House really sits down and says, anong committee ba talaga ito? So there's a bit of confusion there. But I hope they come together before the middle of the year, bago magsona, and uh, that we have something in place. Up to what age ba yung suggested nyo, ano, pwedeng ma-access ang RH services? Well, actually, uh, there should be no limit, no? Kasi once you're a mother, kahit 10 years old ka, you don't want it to happen again. So dapat may access ka sa family planning. And you have access to it because you're a mother. It doesn't matter what age you are. We want to prevent a repeat. So um, what the law will say, we hope, is that pag nabuntis ka, pag may anak ka na, at saka pag nakunang ka na, showing uh, sexually active ka, you can get uh, our age and family planning services uh, without, uh, without uh, any problem. So yun lang ang gusto namin, maging accessible sa mga kabataang nangangailangan ng ng uh, service. Okay. Well, Popcom Director Juan Antonio Perez III, Doc GP, thank you po for joining us tonight. Salamat, Dr. JP. Salamat, Dr. Salamat, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, all. Good evening po. We'll just go to break, so please stay with us. Telekimbo has that to say when it comes to the passage of the proposed Bayanihan 3 Act. All Bayanihan uh, packages will just become completely wasted unless we're able to effectively open up our economy by way of um, uh, expanding the, the uh, coverage of vaccination. Welcome back the Chiefs here on One News. We're now in the final stage of our conversation. Now joining us, Marikina City 2nd District Representative Stella Kimbo. Congresswoman Kimbo, welcome again to the Chiefs. Good evening. Good evening Thanks ma'am. for having me. Mm, ma'am, let's, let's dive straight into it. I think 
people appreciate uh, what a stimulus package is for. We're starting the, to see the economy starting to uh, uh, rev back into, into life. Everybody's uh, quite eager to get in on the action, get back to their jobs and so on. To this end, you're proposing a Bayanihan 3, 420 billion uh, pesos. Your 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 uh, kasama niyo po dito, House Speaker Lord Alan Velasco. Pero parang balamya ang pagtanggap ng Malacanang. Um, and the questions are on on two levels. One is there's they're saying, eh, paano natin bubunuan yan, di ba? Parang kakapasa lang natin ng ng budget. And then on the other hand, on the other side of the budget, the spending. And Malacanang in particular is saying, teka muna, eh, yung bayanihan 2 nga, 25% ng bayanihan 2. Hindi pa natin mailabas-labas, hindi pa natin nagagastos. Your response first to, to all of these concerns. Well, I guess um, first thing is uh, the context. So the Philippine Statistics Authority had recently announced that our GDP contraction for the entire 2020 is uh, or, or was minus 9.5%. No? So that means in terms of in peso terms, that's a 3.2 trillion peso damage, mm. right? So if you add up all the income losses across all Filipinos, that adds up to 3.2 trillion pesos. So the question is, how much of a stimulus is necessary to try to reverse or to try to reverse those uh, losses? Mm. So clearly, um, what has been authorized under Bayanihan 2, which is 165 billion pesos, it's just too small relative to that 3.2 trillion peso economic loss. So, um, and if you ask about uh, the 2021 budget, um, based on my formal inquiry, um, I asked the DBM how much uh, COVID response uh, has or is stuck into the 2021 budget, and their response is something like 838, but mm -hmm. that includes a 580 plus billion mm -hmm. um, DPWH mm -hmm. budget, which had already been uh, planned even way before the pandemic. So long and short of it, um, if you have something like 300 billion in the 2021 budget and 165 billion um, by a Nihan to uh, total amount, um, that's still not enough compared to the 3.2 trillion um, economic loss caused by the pandemic. So what we're saying is, um, let's add an additional at least 420 billion pesos. And that would be more or less that would approximate the original amount uh, that had been approved by Congress under the Arise Bill, mm. which, if you recall, was um, approved sometime in June of uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, I suppose another way of looking at it is that uh, a quarter has not been spent from Bayanihan 2. Is there anything that needs to be put in uh, a proposed bill uh, like uh, Bayanihan 3 that would ensure um, speedy and efficient spending of, uh, of the money that's being allocated uh, para hindi tayo na, na, we're not stuck with another, another quarter of uh, unspent funds. Tama yun, uh, Sir Ed, no? that's a very, very eager Velasco said. Let's look for, well, the, the best practices that had at least emerged under Bayanian 1 and Bayanian 2. So for example, um, under Bayanian 1, uh, the DOF, in partnership with the SSS, uh, was able to implement a 52 billion peso small business wage subsidy program. So they basically gave those uh, wage subsidies and targeted those to the registered um, MSMEs. And, you know, even with a rocky start, they were able to somehow complete that. Mm. So that's an example of something that had already been done. So part of our proposal is to do a second wave of that um, particular program. And so that's what we did. We looked at um, what uh, for example, the SAP, the Social Amelioration mm. Program, uh, or AYUDA, right? So obviously, we had some difficulty under Bayanihan 1 starting it out. Remember that ultimong yung listahan ng beneficiaries, we had a problem with that. But after two tranches, hopefully by now, we've gone down the learning curve. Mm -hmm. So that's sana. something that mm. at least um, we can do at least with, um, with at least more wisdom now. And uh, in fact, uh, the DSWD has experimented on uh, the use of digital platforms, something that they've never uh, done before, before the pandemic. Meaning, um, nung araw, uh, or before the pandemic, uh, if they need to disperse uh, funds, that's going to be done manually, right? But now, um, because of what happened uh, under the mm -hmm. social amelioration program, they're now more open to using more modern technology. 
So things like those. So we have our uh, listed the number of programs that more or less um, has proof of life. And uh, so um, we have, can I just run it down quickly? Mm. Um, we, there's 108 billion peso oh, yeah. uh, mm. budget for Ayuda. And that's mm. more or less 1,000 per Filipino. So that's why it's 108 billion pesos. So for example, for a family of five, so that uh, they would just multiply that by 1,000, so they would get 5,000 pesos. So now it's now dependent on the size of the family. And like under Bayanihan 1, there was a maximum of 8,000 pesos per household. Mm -hmm. And remember that a household could have multiple families. That's one. Of course, households uh, would vary also in size. So kung maliit yung households where kika doon sa 8,000, obviously kung, ma kung maraming families within that household, paghahatian yung 8,000. Mm -hmm. So now um, that has been corrected using this um, per head uh, budget. Yes, um, we also have a total sorry, of 150 million for po, workers. Tar targeted, pa, targeted po rin po itong, ano, itong, uh, itong ayuda na ito. Ibig sabihin, selected people only hindi kasi you mentioned kanina parang 1000 per Filipino eh uh, wala walang socialization program dito si Ed makakatanggap din <laughs> yes you Agarang, know what so, um, of course uh, there has to be may ano naman yun may natural limits naman yun eh kasi you don't expect somebody who lives in Forbes Park to line up for 1000 pesos right <laughs> or you may have more explicit ways of waiving um, that 1000 peso um, uh, ayuda um, but then, you know, we'd rather err on the side of um, over-coverage rather okay. than mm. under-coverage, mm -hmm. particularly, particularly of those who really need it. So right now, the indicative budget is um, 1,000 pesos per head. So in other words, it's uh, walang may iiwan. That's, that's the main message that uh, the speaker wants to Universal, to, um, get ano, universal ayuda. Of course, yes, in other words, woman. Hmm. Yeah, of course, Congresswoman. I mean, everybody wants ayuda, no? And uh, as far as ayuda is concerned, dapat lang talaga tulungan. But a basic question here really is where to get the funds as it is, no? Sa vaccines palang utang na yan. And, and everybody's now worried about the national debt. Can you give us a context as to exactly where we will be at the end of this year uh, with Bayanian 3 and the vaccination rollout in which, uh, you know, the government will have to borrow money to finance the whole thing. At the end of this thing, how much debt will we have in addition to, you know, the debt that we already have? So that's right. The debt that we already have is quite big. We took out 2.82 trillion pesos in loans last year. And, uh, and if you look at our cash position, as of end November, we had 1.6 trillion pesos left in cash. So that's, in other words, there's, um, this based on the estimates of the Research Office of Congress, that's, that's a big amount, right? But that's clearly enough to cover 420 billion pesos for um, assistance, not only for families, um, but also for displaced workers, current workers, currently employed workers, as well as um, adversely affected sectors like the farm sector, um, livestock producers, um, as well as critically impacted MSMEs. So it's, it's, it's really a mix of, um, uh, of Ayuda, meaning dole outs um, for households and um, more productive types of assistance that is targeted uh, for purposes of generating income. So it's really a mix. It's not just pure dole outs for purposes of consumption. We also need dole outs or uh, assistance um, for, for more productive investments. No, hindi naman pwedeng ayuda lang because that's really not going to be sustainable. You need to help um, kabuhayan then, diba? so that it's a little bit more um, sustainable over time. So long and short of it is, at least based on the numbers that we're seeing, the cash is there because we had already taken out a lot of loans. So mm -hmm. now the question is, um, we need to get, of course, some validation from, from our um, economic managers if that amount is still available today, which I think it is. But of course, we need that validation. And, and secondly, um, uh, the reason for why we have a very good credit rating is because, um, because we not only um, have we been able to manage our uh, resources well, and so that's the reason why our uh, macroeconomics, there's good housekeeping in our macroeconomics. And, 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 and part of that is that we are um, assessed to be able to manage debt. 
right? And that's precisely why we need an economic stimulus package from Congress. Mm -hmm. Any kind of utang, uh, kung umutang ka for, for your business, pero ang ginawa mo naman sa utang na yan is uh, pinangsugal mo or pinangsabong mo, clearly, yes. hindi ka makakabayad ng utang mo. And that's why, um, that's the role of Congress. Congress has to line up uh, a good spending program for the loans that you've taken. And so that's precisely what, um, what this Bayanihan 3 is all about. It's a spending plan for whatever resources we have today. And uh, of course, um, the context is, paano natin itatawid tayong lahat? beyond the ayuda, diba? You really but need to like... Still, um, yes, yes. But we still have a strong credit rating, uh, especially given that uh, the economy has contracted. And, well, economists are saying that our economy is one of the worst performing right now in the region. Well, um, that's how it is in every single country in the world, right? Except for a few, like, for example, in our region, except for Vietnam that has been able to grow as well as China, because they were able to, to, um, to control their COVID situation ahead of everyone. But pretty much every single country is facing what we are facing today, recession, right? So, so that's, that's the context. Um, credit rating is based on um, a bunch of things apart from growth. Uh, part of it is um, the management of your revenues as well as your spending. So. Based on all of those, including the contraction, which is pretty big, um, the overall assessment is still we have a good credit rating. So, Congresswoman, you're saying you're planning to finance the Bayanian Tree with the loans. Uh, you will need you will need approval from the executive. And mukang uh, dinanggit ng kanina ni Robbie, mukang malamig ang malakan niyang sa sa using using more funds for a third stimulus package. And uh, a lot of uh, aid nga dam is already embedded in the 2021 budget. And dyan na nga, sinabi na rin nila, and uh, a fourth of the Bayanihan 2 is not yet even disbursed. So an anong, and even, even the senators are saying, where are you going to get the funding? I think they're looking for actual revenue sources, not for loans. Anong isasagot nyo? They will, sabi ni Senator Grace po, they're not going to put up a counterpart fund unless explain daw kung saan gagaling yung, yung funding. Uh, what, what's the, is this the response that you will get it from loans? Well, as I said, nauna na yung pagkuha ng utang. So na front load yung pagkuha ng utang, having 1.6 trillion pesos in cash as of end November, that's a huge amount. It's, it's, you, that's more than the usual. That's what I'm saying. So how would you use that, right? The best use is um, for stimulus. We are in a situation where our country has contracted in a grand way. It's the biggest contraction ever since the Second World War. So the question is, how are we going to recover, right? Yeah, if we don't, if we don't, if government doesn't spend more, we're stuck. Businesses will continue to close. And when businesses close, jobs are destroyed. That's the problem. Yeah, Congresswoman. Ang gusto natin mag-spend ng stimulus to prevent closure. Yeah. Preventing closure will mean you're able to save jobs. Ang hirap kasi if the mentality is, let's wait for the businesses to close and then saka mo ayudahan. Ang problema doon is many of the jobs will be permanently damaged. Yeah. Why? Because businesses won't be able to restart. There's a cost to restart the business. Ay, ay, Congresswoman, ay, beyond restarting, uh, the big discussion, for, of course, for everyone is not just to recover, but to grow, to, to, to put the Philippines on a, on a path of, of growth. And... But we have to bring this in. In Congress, the big, the big debate is not even Bayanihan 3, it's cha-cha. Um, and and, and yung ina, that's one of the things na sinasabi na kailangan natin ng cha-cha kung gusto natin mag-compete, kung gusto natin makakuha ng, mm, ng investors. investors. But how do you see it now, given the urgency of Bayanihan 3, the immediate impact that you argue it, it will have, and the longer-term arguments for, for cha-cha? Will this go... Do, do these two debates go hand in hand? Do these two proposals go hand in hand? Or ironically, is Chacha economic provisions a distraction from the urgency that you're trying to communicate for Bayanihan 3? You, you're absolutely correct, Robbie, that all of these things go hand in hand. It's like, it's like cooking a meal, right? Um, there's not, it's, it, 
it's going to be more than one ingredient, right? So economic stimulus is just a way to keep businesses afloat, right? It's really just survival. But to go back to the um, pre-pandemic growth trajectory, kumbaga na discarrel yung trend, mm. no? So ngayon, gusto mo siyang ibalik doon sa, doon sa realis so that you're back on that same trajectory. So those ter so so econ chacha is is necessary. In fact, yeah, right, uh, even I, yeah, Congressman, even, I, okay. I guess yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Can you hear ahead, me? Okay. Let, let me just explain very simplistically why econ chacha is needed. Simple lang. Kulang ang domestic capital natin. Kulang ang capital sa ating bansa to 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 um, generate a sufficient number of jobs. Ano yung proof? And dami natin OFWs. We cannot create a sufficient number of jobs for our own population. Ergo, Filipinos have to leave the country. Simple lang yan eh, di ba? Kung meron kang sariling business, kulang ang kapital mo, anong gagawin mo? Either umutang ka or maghahanap ka ng partner and that partner will bring in extra capital. Yun ang kailangan natin. As a country, kulang ang kapital. Of course, um, ayaw natin na mag-rely completely on utang because as you earlier mentioned, paano baka magkaroon tayo ng debt crisis. Hmm. So the other option is, maghanap tayo ng partners. Maghanap tayo ng partners sa ibang bansa. Yun ang ginagawa ng uh, Econ Chacha. But again, um, pagtingnan natin yung uh, the, the legal lease of the Econ Chacha um, House Resolution, ang ginagawa lamang nun is to make these provisions subject to ordinary amendments rather than constitution rather than it be um, amended mm. by way of uh, this, mm. this, uh, this mm. more protracted process as defined by the Constitution. Yeah. Yun lang ang ginagawa niya. Um, we're trying to put in more flexibility into these very restrictive economic provisions. Yeah. So yun lang, di ba? Mm. Um, that's, that's really just the first step. Yeah, and, um, and Congresswoman, exactly. I, I'm, I'm sorry to, I, but I, all of this is well taken, and I think uh, it won't surprise you that we will be inviting you. That it's an entirely another episode altogether, or two or three. But I'll, I'll just cut to one basic uh, question. Assuming uh, if both are needed, I, I think one real question for people for Congress right now is: Do you have time for both? I mean, or do you have to choose? Ano bang ipaglalaban na natin dito? Because even Chacha on its own, people are skeptical as to whether or not you have the finite resources uh, for this, specifically the finite resource of time. Well, una sa lahat, um, if you recall, yung bayanihan one, na ipasita po namin yun in one day. Diba? So, um, we started at 9 in the morning, we ended at 3 a.m. So, kakayanin kung uh, kailangan, right? Um, pagdating naman sa, sa RBH2, so that's a resolution of both houses, number two, yun yung uh, pangalan ng Econ Chacha resolution. Um, it has already been approved at the committee level. So uh, pagdating sa plenaryo, magkakaroon ng debate. Um, tingin ko, there, there is enough time. I mean, you know, I nasa Congress ako halos araw-araw at nakikita ko naman na uh, kakayanin na, na ma-manage ang, ang debate. Of course, um, I don't know how it's going to be in the Senate. Of course, that's a different matter altogether. Pero kung tatanungin lamang ang, uh, ang sitwasyon sa Congress, tingin ko kakayanin. And pag, pag um, papakinggan ninyo yung tema ng mga debate, hindi naman marami yung punto eh. So tingin ko um, it's, it's a manageable debate. Aren't you worried that it will set a dangerous precedent to make it so easy and so quickly to amend, to introduce amendments to the Constitution? Kasi kung dadagdagan lang natin bawat proposal ng ano, unless otherwise provided by law. So ano-ano nang pwedeng gawin dyan? Yan, yan yung isa sa mga concerns na i-raise ng mga tao against Chacha, especially at this time. Again, based on actual experience, hindi ganun kadali yun. Case in point, yung Public Service Act. The Public Service Act seeks to define public utilities. And as you know, the ownership of public utilities is one of the economic provisions here in RBH2. The debate in the Public Service Act in the Congress has been over almost eight months. Okay? So it's not that easy. Just because um, it's... What is it? It depends on the topic. 
I'm sure pagdating sa land ownership, because land tends to be a very emotional um, issue, I'm sure mahihirapan din yan. So, ano eh, um, of course, admittedly, ang isang, uh, what, ang isang disadvantage meron kami ngayon is syempre mababa ang trust levels namin, admittedly. Pag sinasabi namin, huwag kayong mag-alala, repeatedly sinasabi ng house leaders, sinasabi ng speaker na this is going to be solely limited to the economic provisions. Yes. Syempre, at this point in time, um, it's a leap of faith on the part of the public. Pero, ano naman eh, um, maraming indications na mapapatotoo yan. Dahil ang pinakamalaking uh, uh, evidence para sa akin is yung plebiscite. Ita time natin sa election. In other words, um, this Congress, kung maipapasaman namin ito, hindi po kami magbe-benefit dyan. Because okay. it has to go through a plebiscite. Okay, but going back to the economic provisions, no, the point has been made that it's not really the uh, the economic provisions that we need in order to to uh, jumpstart the economy again, especially after COVID. No? It's more... Uh, other factors like uh, ease of business, eh, uh, eh, 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 siguro taxes, infrastructure, uh, you know, the lack of uh, telecommunications and high electricity rates. These are the factors that discourage foreign direct investments. So how sure are you that with, a, you know, with these amendments, those FDIs will in fact come pouring in? We're not sure, as you had said. I, I'm, I'm saying it's just a necessary first step. It's like you have, right now, you have a property that says no trespassing. Because there's a no trespassing sign, no one's going to come to you. That's for sure. But if you remove the no trespassing sign and you make your land attractive, you make your, your land um, fertile, right? And uh, you show signs that, you know, there's, uh, um, you can grow rice here or something else, mm. then your investors might come in. But if you don't remove the no trespassing sign, no one's going to come. Well, let me, so, let me, so uh, that's where we are. I, I hope you don't, uh, let, me, let me take that metaphor, no? because you said it's a necessary first step. Uh, we see the point about it being a necessary step, but is it necessarily necessary as the first step? Because some people, to, to Lucci's point precisely, are saying, no, uh, no the first step is to... to uh, instead of putting up a sign, no trespassing, or put up a sign that says, open for business. What's wrong with saying no trespassing if I can say naman, we're open for business. Also, I'm easy to deal with. Parang, those things, those interventions are what are people are saying that you don't need to change the constitution to send the signal and the message to the world that we, 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 we are transparent, we're easy to do business with, our rules are, are predictable, um, and we will respect contracts and things like this. Uh, this is not to take away the necessary step of uh, perhaps loosening the rules for allowing foreign investments, but the question is, does it have to be the first step? Even in that metaphor that you, that you have, mm -hmm. if you have a closed property, I can always say open for business. Mm, parang ayusin mo muna yung bakuran mo bago mm. buksan ang bakuran. Mm. But that's, precise, but that's precisely the point, right? It's, it's really a signal. If you have less restrictive economic provisions, that's equivalent to a sign that says open for business. So that, that's, that's also um, a equivalent to a sign that says we are easy to deal with. Right now, if I'm a foreigner and I can only own up to 40% of a corporation, that means I don't have controlling interest. Paano ko sasabihin... Na, ay, madaling magnegosyo sa Pilipinas. I cannot even have control over the capital that I will put in unless I make all of these um, arrangements using lawyers. I mean, how can that even mean that we it's easy to do business in the Philippines? So, so that's precisely the point, Robbie. Exactly, I completely agree with you, except that um, in my head, um, to implement um, that that idea of saying open for business. Unfortunately, I believe that you really need to put in flexibility into these economic provisions. Even the major business groups are saying this is not the time for economic cha-cha, and they said there are enough pending legislation that you can work. I'm not sure because many of these business groups have actually attended our Congress hearing. I'm, I attended all of those hearings from start to end. Many business groups... Uh, 
spoke in that in, in those hearings. So and and we've invited um, and it, this is actually not the first time it had been taken up. So looking at the records, um, I, I'm not sure I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marikina City. Okay. Okay. <laughs> issue the statement then MMGC, PCCI. And they're saying it's not the time. Well, th those are just one or two business groups. But if you look at the list of those who spoke, I am an, I'm an economist. I mean, you know, I, I look at data. And if you really listen to, to the conversation and those hearings, it's, it's a little bit lopsided in, in favor of really having less restrictive um, economic provisions. Okay, Marikina City, 2nd District Congresswoman Stella Kimbo. Ma'am, we certainly are going to have you again <laughs> in this program. Thank <laughs> you po right. for joining us tonight. Thank Maraming you. Thank you. Bye. So Bye. And that will be all for this uh, Wednesday edition of The Chiefs. We hope all the discussion will keep the conversation going. I'm Edlin Gao. I'm Ami Paminto, and of the Philippine Star. I'm Luchi Cruz Valdez of News 5. I'm Robbie Alampay, and we are One News.